What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Dad Tough. I'm your host, Blake Brown, and today we're sitting with the one and only DSO, aka Dad Starting Over. Man, I'm glad you could come on today. I'm really excited about this. Well, um, thank you for having me, man. I appreciate it. Awesome. Well, we are going to start this thing off right. We're going to do what I call a shot and story where we take shots and you tell us a little bit about yourself. This segment is brought to you by High Ridge Spirits, the distillery. If you've not checked this place out, make sure you give it a good check. And guys, awesome environment. All their alcohol is brewed and distilled in Florence, Alabama, in store. Like I said, it, they have live music almost every night of the week. They have open mic nights on Wednesday. So if you want to sing a song, tell a story, uh, read a joke, whatever you want to do, guys, make sure you get signed up on that list. Well, that sounds like a cool place. Oh, yeah. Oh, it is. It is pushing buttons over here. Oh, uh, yeah, man. Let's say it's a good place, man. It's not a young, it's not a big young crowd, not your college, typical college bar. They don't do dollar beers. You go in, you drink alcohol, and, and you know, you, you listen to music. That's about it, man. It's, it's, it's nice, you know. Very cool. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm going to be drinking some of their damn good vodka. I see what I've done there. I push more buttons. There you That's go. <laughs> There we go. I'm back. I'm back. But I'm going to be taking a sip of their damn good vodka, man. It's it's awesome. It's awesome. It's got a good backstory, I'll, too. We'll just pretend this is booze. It's Diet Coke, but it'll do. Uh, well, I, I guess I'm kind of an alcoholic. Uh, salud. Or <laughs> salud, German, buddy. <laughs> yeah, prost or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about yourself, man. Well, where should you start? Do you want to go into... Uh, you know, what got me here to the dad starting over world. I mean, as of right now, I'm a 46 year old man with four kids and my second marriage living in the uh, middle of nowhere, Kentucky, not originally from here, um, as you may not be able to tell with the accent, but uh, I've been living here. I, you know, I was thinking about it. I've been living here for most of my adult life. So that's kind of weird. Still don't feel not like a Kentuckian, but, <laughs> but uh, grew up in Indiana. So I was a Hoosier for most oh, of my life. Yeah. yeah sorry i know <laughs> <laughs> hey man it is what it is you know but yeah you are the author of a very popular book called the dead bedroom fix the dead bedroom fix you're right the, the dead bedroom fix so pretty much that book it, it helps men to develop i guess a more intimate relationship to with their yeah. with their spouse i mean as we all know you know, I don't know your situation. Are you married yourself or have I mean, been? I've married, I've married, have two kids, one with a, uh, a previous uh, woman. We weren't married. Okay. But yeah. <laughs> it may, it may not come as a shock to you that the majority of men who are married say, I'm not having nearly as much sex as I think I should be. No, absolutely. Um, <laughs> so when I started my website at dadstartingover.com, which started basically as a blog, just me writing as a newly divorced guy who had been cheated on the whole nine yards. And my thoughts, I wrote an, uh, one post about sex and marriage and I had done some reading on the topic and I saw that the popular term for it was dead bedroom. I didn't coin the term and hardly any of my posts up to that point got any kind of traffic at all. I write about sex and marriage and boom, all of a sudden I start getting emails I'm like there's something to this. Right. And it took one guy to say, you know, you should write a book on this. I like some of the stuff you said and I will say no more. It didn't take much, you know, to inflate my ego. So I wrote a book <laughs> and it didn't go anywhere for a while, a couple of years, nothing. And then, um, got with some guys who helped me with some search engine optimization type stuff. Hey, you should advertise on Facebook and just a little inside. I, um, totally new to the world of Facebook advertising. I put an ad, I think I spent the first night 25 bucks. I think it was like right before I went to bed, let's, Facebook spending 25 bucks a day on this ad. Let's see what happens for advertising the dead bedroom fix. It was, you could download it from my website or go to Amazon audible and get it. And in the first night spent 25, I woke up the next morning and I had 700 bucks in my account. So I said, well, that's pretty good return on my money. 25 wow. bucks. I, I, let's do that again. I've been chasing that high ever since <laughs> <laughs> it's either with the world of Facebook and every, I don't know what's going on, but every guy to, everybody kind of reports the same thing, man, it really starts off strong and then kind of peters from there. So, but it's been doing consistently well for, I wrote the thing in 2017. 
So yeah, we're going like five years of advertising the thing. I've sold, you know, it's been six figures now as far as number of copies sold. Um, my biggest format is Audible, which I read it myself. I'm a former radio guy, so I'm kind of comfortable on the microphone. I don't mind doing that kind of stuff. I've got the podcast and so forth. And it's kind of blossomed from there. That book was what got a lot of eyeballs on my website. And from there, it was offering my services as coaching, hiring four other gentlemen to help out with that. We, and then we started a members only portion of the website called the DSO fraternity. DSO stands for dad starting over. And we have live meetings. We record all of our live meetings. So we have a catalog of live meetings that we had. Uh, we have a members only pod podcast. You can download, listen to all my books. Uh, we have a, um, discussion groups that are live 24 seven on Facebook, private groups that only members can get into. And that's been pretty huge. And we have just over 800 members from all over the world right now. And, th and this all stemmed from a divorce. Yes, very much so. Yeah. I, um, you know, I don't like to go down that road too much because water under the bridge, but I was, there was infidelity, not on my part and uh, divorce right after. And that really rocked my world. And I had a real hard time coping with that and learn how to deal with it. I, up to that point, I, you know, I dealt with death and whatever and things like that and money and all that stress, but this was different. And part of my coping of that was get online and start reading and writing and talking to other guys. And that's where it took off from there. And I realized there, there was some of this kind of relationship, man, talking bits and pieces everywhere. And it all interconnected with, I'm married and not so happy. I'm married and not having the sex life that I want. I'm newly divorced. What the hell happened? I, I was cheated on. Where did that come from? How did I get to this point? I'm in a really toxic marriage, you name it. And it's all intertwined together. And that basically is the dadstartingover.com website. All the articles, podcasts, all that good stuff. Right. Now, now the way I kind of explain to, I, I guess, some of the friends, some of my friends that, it, you know, I've, you know, shared the, the dead bedroom fix with and, and, you know, things like that. And it, the way I kind of comp compare it is, you know, I've read the book, the five languages of love, you know, and I, I feel like, correct me if I'm wrong. I feel like yours is more of a, of a alpha male top way versus the you know, the dead bedroom fix. And, and that's, that's the thing I was actually, I was reading the, I was, you know, like you say, men are fixers. We, we want to fix stuff, yeah. you know? And, and so that was, you know, that was obviously it was me. Cause I was reading the, you know, the five languages of love on top of the dead bedroom fix. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, I kind of leaned a little bit more towards the, the dead bedroom fit or the, the five languages of love, because, you know, that's the way, you know, you know, you're supposed to love, you know, things like that, you know, and, and I, I read a little bit of the dead bedroom fix and, and I kept noticing while I'm doing this five languages of love, I'm, I'm kind of resorting over a little bit towards the dead bedroom fix, man. And that's one thing I've noticed is one thing that sticks out the most to me in your book is find something for you, you know, mm. uh, not being, uh, so there's something for you other than being a dad or a, or a husband, find something for yourself, you know, a mission, and a mission, a mission, you know, and, that, and that's something I've noticed, you know, even in, within my relationship, you know, I've done the, the five languages of love and it was good for a little bit. And then it just kind of teetered off. I mean, it really did. I'm not gonna lie. It teetered off. And so, so I was looking for another fix. Yeah. So I, I completed mm -hmm. your book. And, and that's one thing I can, I can say is like this podcast, you know, has, it, it was my thing. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't start this because of the book. I'd already had this lined out, mm -hmm. but seeing the the difference with my wife, you know, starting this, I'm not home as much. You know, I'm devoting a lot of my time that normally I'd be sitting on the couch watching TV with the wife or, mm -hmm. or constantly, you know, pestering her, begging her for sex, you know, and, and that kind of this, uh, it, it kind of went away a little bit. And so, you know, I was doing my own thing, doing this. And, and that's mm -hmm. when I really like, it really clicked with me with your book, because yeah. all of a sudden, you know, I'm this needy guy, you know, just, I'm, I pestered the wife all the time for sex. That's all I think about, you know, mm -hmm. that's just, that's me. But, but, you know, finding something else to focus my mind on made me less needy, which is one of your big things, you know, quit being needy. Yeah. And I noticed a huge change in my wife. Like I, 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 she, she flipped that switch, you know, so you, so you say, uh, mm -hmm. I said, I wasn't home near as much. 
uh, didn't focus all my time on chasing her, you know, doing my own thing. You know, there's probably a week that went by that I didn't even ask for it. And she's like, Oh shit, what is going on? <laughs> you know, a nervous. Yeah. Yeah. Made her a little nervous. And that, and that was the thing, man, that, that was really like the big turning point for me and, and, in, in my marriage and, and doing something so simple is, is finding me a mission. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, it, there's a lot of books that don't talk about. So the fight like, we just didn't talk about that. You know, mm-hmm. it didn't talk about that at all. It was more yeah. on, you know, showing the love a, a certain way versus, you know, you gotta, you gotta work on you. And that's one thing I've noticed is, is being a, a husband was, you mm-hmm. know, my happiness revolved on how well my marriage was going. Um, you know, if I wasn't getting sex, you know, it affected everything, you know, it affected work, it affected, mm-hmm. you know, the relationship with my kids, it affected, you know, every aspect. And that's something mm-hmm. that I've kind of, that's the most, that's the thing that stood out to me the most was, was to find something for yourself, a, a purpose other than being a husband and a dad, get your ass out of the house yeah, and, and find something for you, you know, and I'm sure that I'll oh, go ahead. You're just say something. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I accidentally clicked off of you. There. Um, you know, <laughs> if it's, um, at its most basic primal level, and I talk about this in the book, you know, the history of mankind and two people pair bonding together and forming a couple that goes beyond well, well beyond for thousands of generations of people have done this relationship thing together. Right. And we're, we're trying to shoehorn our modern day Oh, norms and societal, what's considered good behavior and so forth into a very primal, natural thing, which basically could be boiled down. It's not a very good way of describing that, but basically it can be boiled down for men, which is get off your ass, go out and do something. Um, in the way olden days, caveman days, it's get out of the cave and go kill something and bring it back home. And if you were lying on your back doing nothing all day, which in modern day terms is watching television, invariably the reaction of the woman and really your community is going to be like, what the hell's wrong with this guy? And we've kind of gotten away from that because I think the modern day norm, for whatever reason, we could argue what the driver of this is culturally or politically or whatever is, is to kind of, for lack of a better term, soften men. And we, we prop up that soft stuff a little bit too much. You're helping the kids out with homework. Yeah, you're an awesome dad. You're, you're helping out with cooking and cleaning. Yeah, you're an awesome dad. And all these things are required. It's just part of being an adult and a parent. But it's the fact that we prop them up so much as, dude, that's it. That's the Shangri La. That's the pinnacle of being a man right there. And we just totally negate all the other stuff, which is the most basic primal stuff, which ironically is the stuff that makes your wife go, well, hello, who's this? Oh. Um that's your wife didn't recognize you from across the room. The very first time she saw you and said, he looks cute. Wonder what his name is. She didn't follow that up with. I wonder if he also is good at ironing clothes. (laughs) (laughs) She was just like, I wonder who he is. I wonder what he's up to. I wonder what he's like. I wonder if he's a nice guy. I wonder what he does for a living. I want mystery, a little bit of that nice, healthy anxiety. And we just get away from that. When you live with each other and you're on top of each other, 24, seven, and the mystery, the anxiety, the whatever is gone, and you're just there 24-7, it's just, it's a recipe for disaster. And complacency that, kicks in. <laughs> complacent comfort kicks in. Comfort yeah, is comfort. Just, that's a killer for men. As soon as you're comfort comfortable and you put your feet up and you're just yeah. like, I don't have a thing to worry about anymore, oof, it's over. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, you, the, you always the, gotta be chasing. You always gotta be working. You always gotta be going out and with a mission and trying to do something, better yourself as a man. The second you don't, your wife and society in general just says, what the hell's wrong with you? And that's when you notice things start going downhill. That's the playbook that most guys have now for marriage. That's just what you do. You just sit around, do nothing, take take Billy to the soccer games and come home and sleep. That's about it. Trash, you know. And then if you're lucky, you roll over to your wife, who's already in bed before you are, and just say, you want to? And she's maybe once every couple of weeks, she says, yeah, hurry up. (laughs) And you're like, woohoo, that's awesome. No. <laughs> no, no, it's not. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> that, like, that was my first marriage, basically. Wrong. And I'm not, you know, I don't want to go down the road of that horrible woman. No, 
I, I was, I'm introspective enough to look at myself and say, oof, I really effed up in a lot of ways. And uh, that was the genesis of the book was me looking back and going, man, how did I F up in that? How do I see everybody else doing it? And why is it that some guys, this is key. Some guys are able to be in a marriage for many years and they still love each other. They're a sexy couple. They're, they're, they're playing grab ass when nobody's looking, they're kissing each other out in the hallway when nobody's looking. Why are those people different from the rest? What do they have? Is there, exactly. some little, is there some little thing that they have that the rest of us can learn from? Yeah, probably. Absolutely. Why not? And it probably starts from the very beginning of the relationship. And it sounds sexist, but the man and his, the way he kind of leads and navigates the relationship has a lot to do with it. And no, I'm not, you know, letting women off the hook. Some of you women out there absolutely suck at relationships. Like you don't, you don't put a, a damn bit of effort into it whatsoever. You just think you can show up and that's it. And with so many thirsty, desperate men out there that have led them to believe that, you know, absolutely. that's why we have these 300 pound plus women on, on the uh, online dating with a laundry list of what, what's good in a man and what they will, uh, <laughs> what they're looking for. And you're looking like, how the hell does she think she can get away with this? Because in general, she can get away with it. She still gets a free dinner a couple yeah, times yeah. a week. She goes, still gets dates and sex. So a lot of women aren't bringing a lot to the table, kind of going off on a tangent there, but, uh, the, but that's them and we can't control them. Right. We can only yeah. control us. And that's the purpose of the book. The website, the fraternity is we can control us. And when you kind of know what buttons to push and what knobs to tweak and mission is a big part of it. Um, you notice, wow, everything kind of starts taking care of itself, including the whole bedroom situation at home with the wife. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to me, that's the most important part. You know, it, like, I mean, speaking from, from myself, if, if I don't have a good sex life, I'm not, you know, I'm not happy. I'm not sticking around period. You know, you can do everything right. You can do everything right. But if I'm not getting sex, you're doing everything wrong. <laughs> well, because why? Because your roommates at that point. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can get a roommate anywhere. Anywhere. I can, get a, I can get a buddy. I can get friends. I can get platonic female friends that I have no interest in any kind of sexual anything with. I'll hang out with them. We'll right. talk, we'll have coffee, whatever. It's not what you want in a marriage or in a long-term partnership, whatever it may be. Right. Um, but we're going towards those something that's kind of not so nice, which is, and it's something I've harped on. And a lot of guys don't like to hear it, to be honest with you, is, hey, guys, this marriage game, it ain't for everybody. It just flat out isn't. And I think that is something that your more traditional conservative types have really kind of mis dropped the ball on right. um, is that they have pushed like marriage and family, marriage and family, marriage and family. If you don't achieve this, what good are you? Absolutely. To which, to which a lot of people out there, I say, mm, I want to give that a second thought. Um, I, uh, you know, part of my business, a big part of my business, the, the fastest growing is the coaching where I talk to men one-on-one -on, -one on the phone for an hour at a time. And, um, I hear horror stories of my dad left just example off the top of my head. My dad left, uh, I was left with a mother who became very abusive and narcissistic. She married some stepfather who abused the hell out of me. She, um, my whole life, all I hear was don't become like your father, et cetera, et cetera. Next thing I know I'm in failed relationship after failed relationship. And I've been married three times and I got eight kids and yet why the hell do you keep doing this? Well, just what you do. Rock. No, <laughs> it's not. How about you take a time out and go, I got some issues. Rock. And those issues kind of go back to when I was a youngin and uh, when I was a kid and I need to get those things straightened out before I keep bringing more broken human beings into the world. And uh, those guys tend to find some really broken women to pair up with too. Absolutely. And uh, I hear that all the time. And I just wish it was hammered into people's heads. Take your time. But also at the same time, I recognize that kind of butts heads with the concept, which is uh, kind of foreign to us men, which is the biological clock. Uh, there's a woman who's 25 years old and she's like, I'm ready to have a kiddo. And, uh, but she has a laundry list of awful baggage in her wake and failed relationships. And she's like, I don't care. I want a kid. And that doesn't end well. And they tend to attract the kind of guys that I talk to on a daily basis. And, um, doesn't end well. And most more often than not, it ends in a dead bedroom, but that's just one small symptom of a really toxic relationship. Right. Yeah. Uh, where do you think men mess up the most at as a, as a whole, 
as, as far as, you know, failed relationships, failed, you know, dead bedrooms. Yeah. Um, the term vetting, if you're familiar with the term vetting their candidate, their wife candidate, which means really, um, yeah, women are very good uh, men. You know, I talked about the 300 pound woman with the laundry list of this is what I want in a man. Right. Good for them. She knows what she wants and she's not going to settle. All right, cool. Hell, high five sister. We don't see that from men nearly enough men. It's like, well, she's kind of pretty and she likes me and done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, just, that's about it. Um, what if we were to say, you know, she come from a good family. Um, what's the relationship with her father? Like she got a good head on her shoulders. Um, she make a decent living for herself because it's 2021 and not so sure. I want to take on the uh, whole, uh, stay at home mom thing while I pay all the bills to them. I've that's, this is me talking. I've seen that. I've seen that end not so well, many, many times. So is she able to take care of herself and buy that fancy purse that she wants? Good for her. Good relationship with her family. What are her past relationships like? She take care of herself physically. Is she a healthy person? You know, all these things. A lot of men hear that. And to me, especially at this point in my life, that's like a, well, duh. Yeah. But to a lot, to a lot of guys, they're kind of wide eyed, like, never thought about that before. <laughs> right the the bedroom ends up being the being the cause of the dead bedroom because you know <laughs> like you said guys are just like, oh okay well yeah she's pretty she wants to have sex with me you know let's, let's well, do it and and i'll tell you what and um again you'll often hear me say it sounds a little sexist but a lot of stuff that's not so nice but true tends to sound a little sexist in this relationship game both ways for men and women um it's true. Those really hot young ones that are very hypersexual. What tends to go along with that? Cheating. <laughs> I was going to say not, not so, not so good up here in the brains department. Uh, they're right. a little, little nuts. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, crazy in head, crazy in bed. So if you know, these poor guys that I talk to have very little experience with women, maybe like a girlfriend or two casual in high school, and then they meet her. And she's over the top hot. She's hypersexual. Oh my God, she does anything and everything. And she validates the hell out of me and makes me, you know, feel like a king. I'm going to not, am I going to marry her? I'm going to marry her tomorrow. And oh, she wants to have a kid or two. Let's do it. Um, those, those don't end well. And I hear that more often. Than not. No one is pulling that guy aside for whatever reason, putting their arm around him and saying, cool, cool your jets, you know, Probably. give it a few years. What's the hurry? Yeah. You know, date her for a while, date around, date 12 others. She's not going anywhere, but nobody does that in the man world. Over on the women's side, she's got a chorus of women telling her, are you sure this is the one? What's he do for a living? Um, does he have kids? Does he not? Does he want to have kids? And there, there are a lot of guys misinterpret that as it's kind of cold and bitchy to be that way when it comes to relationships. I think we could learn a thing or two from the women in that regard. Right. No, absolutely. Yeah. So, and where do men fall, you know, in the whole relationship game, they don't vet the candidate enough. Absolutely. It's, that's it's, what I see again and again. You know, and, and I mean, I can speak for that personally, you know, me and my wife, you know, we, <laughs> shit, I met her on Tinder, buddy. I swapped right on her. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, and, and it was, it was, you know, obviously it was physical because I mean, they'll give you a little bit of, you know, base profile on there, but, but typically you're going for looks, you know, and, you know, yeah. I'm just, I'm just scrolling through and then I see my wife, she's in a bikini in a pool behind a beer pong float that just, you know, screamed America, you know, and I was like, man, I'm going to marry her, <laughs> you know? And then, yeah. you know, years down the road, I find my, I've, you know, I found myself, you know, and almost divorced, you know, almost, you know, or, or a dead bedroom. You know, and I mean, I'm not afraid to admit it. You know, I've had a lot of problems with the dead bedroom, you know, mm -hmm. but, you know, like reading your book and stuff, it, it's definitely helped for sure. Well, good. It, it good. has. It, it honestly has. And it, and it, it like, so you take a, take more of like a, like an alpha male approach to it. I, I, but I like that, but you, but it's really more for care for yourself and the other things will come, whether, whether it's your, your physical health yeah. or, you know, your mental state of being, or, you know, like I said, you know, previously the find something for you, find you a mission, something that gets you going every day besides your wife and kids. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's awesome. It's helped my marriage, you know, well, good, good. It had, and, 
in the process, has your wife been resistant? Has she been kind of overly anxious about the changes that she sees in you? Oh yeah, no, absolutely. I've been accused of possibly cheating and, mm -hmm. and you know, everything, but honestly, it, it made me feel good in, in a way though. <laughs> I well, mean, seriously, sure. cause it's like, well, hell, yeah. where the hell did this come from? She always, oh, bam, she does care. You know, uh, you know, I'm starting to go to the gym. Well, I, I just figured you were going to the gym, getting shaped to leave me, you know? And I'm like, hold up. First of all, I don't have to be in shape <laughs> to find <laughs> another woman, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, just, just the reactions that, you know, I've gotten from her. I love my wife. Death. She's a good woman. I mean, she really is. She's great kind of had a little bedroom issue, you know, but like I said, just, just seeing like how she reacted to the things like, like, for example, starting this podcast, voting, you know, my time into my mission, like it just drove her crazy. Like you're never home, you know, mm. you're never home. You don't spend time with me anymore. Like, and I'm like, sorry, you know, this, this is something mm. I've got to do. And this is something for me, you know, this is something but I would assume you're still carving out some time for her. Oh yeah. No, no, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Every chance yeah. I get, every chance I get. Yeah. <laughs> which is a good segue into another part where men fail. And um, this is something that they're kind of taking a page from the woman's playbook. And this is where a lot of women fail. And then men follow a lot of women fail in I'm married and I'm a mom now. Oh, that's my role in life. I'm a mom right. and done. Um, and it takes the man kicking and screaming and dragging him out of the house to go on a date with him. Wow. And the women are resistant. And I, got, I don't trust anybody with my kids. I, I'm, I'm worried about them. I have anxiety when I leave them. Um, I don't feel good about my physical appearance anymore. I don't feel sexy and fun like I used to. And then men kind of follow suit and go into the, well, I guess I'm a, a frumpy old dad then. That's, that's my role. Excuse me while I burp. Um, so it's great that you have the mission, but you, yeah, you have to carve out that time for you and wife time. And that means no kids. That means going away for a weekend somewhere. And uh, if your wife is like most, it will, there will be some kicking and screaming. Well, I have this to do. I have that to do. There's so many things around the house. There's so many, I can't just pick up and leave and go. So, no, we're going to do it. That's wow. what we're going to do. Um, I often tell the story. Uh, my wife is a surgeon. So she's a very type A woman, controlling, smart, whatever. And, uh, no weak man is going to be able to be her husband. And, but when I, <laughs> I'm trying to think of the right term, I always use the term, break that horse, you know, that term, you know, where you got a wild horse and you got to break them yeah. where they finally calm down. So to uh, speak, it's kind of when you're with those type A women, you have to uh, break the horse, so to speak, which basically means show them that they can trust you. Like this is a, a man that I can trust who knows what he's doing because every other man in my life has always been down here and I've been up here as far as the controlling aspect or successful aspect. So a woman who's a surgeon, yeah, it's going to be tough. Well, I decided uh, this was several years ago. I'm going to take her away two or three days to New York City. And she tested me every step of the way. Where are we going? What are we doing? What, what are we doing when we get there? Where's the play? And I remember distinctly, we get off the subway and I'm like, she's like, okay, where are we going? Cause I wanted to surprise her the whole step of the way. I'm go, we're going to one, two, three South 31st street. And she's like, okay, first of all, she used to live in New York when she was in medical school. And she says, uh, you don't say that in New York, in New York, you say 31st and fifth, you know, the cross streets. So I'm just like rolling my eyes like, <laughs> all right, it's 31st and fifth street. Yada, yada. Well, is it this direction or that direction? And the old me would have kind of thrown my bags down and said, you know what, bitch, we're done. We're going home. <laughs> right. But it was just knew me just kind of laughed at her. Like, you know, how do you just kind of pat her on the head saying, Shh, it's okay. <laughs> Let me handle it. And kind of perturbed her a little bit, but it, she loosened up as the weekend went and it's been years. She hasn't shut up about that weekend since. It was the most amazing thing that a man could handle from this, from A to Z. She, this is so sweet that everything was so thoughtful and so much fun. He just took care of all of it. And I just sat back and didn't have to do a thing. Didn't have to worry about anything. Holy crap. No one's ever done that before. Um, that's one example of a guy who just says, let me handle it. We're doing it all. I don't give a shit about your resistance along the way. And your, you know, we call those shit tests along the way to see. And for those that don't know the concept of the shit test, I didn't invent this. It's basically when your partner or anyone in your life gives you shit to make sure that you are the shit, so to speak. 
Uh, so you're, you're, you know, I, I often give the example in a, a non-sexual relationship example is um, uh, your boss hires you at a job. And one of the things that he hired you, you guys agree that you're not going to work any weekends. And he's like, yep, Monday through Friday, that's it. You start next week. Hallelujah. Two weeks later, he's like, I need you to come in on Saturday. Shit test. <laughs> a, a, a guy worth his salt who's, who's got a good head on his shoulders and confidence is, um, remember our deal? Uh, this is why I got hired on. No, I'm not coming in on Saturday. If you need somebody for that, I'm afraid you're going to have to find somebody else. A guy who says, oh, okay, the boss knows got him. I can get him for Saturday. I can get him for Sunday, probably every other week, holidays. He's going to be that guy. Everybody else, they can go, but he'll be that guy. Cool. W wife, I can't believe you're doing this. can't believe you're doing that. What about Billy's soccer game? We can't go out. All right, fine. We'll stay home. She's thinking, got him. That's uh, he. I, that's all it took. He's off his mission, so to speak, or whatever. All it took was one little gripe for me, and he folds. Not much of a man there. Um, you see that stuff. Once, once you're aware of that, you see that all the time in any kind of relationship. And women in romantic relationships seem to be really adept at that for whatever reason. They're always testing their dude. Um, can't you stay home from the gym tonight? Do you really have to go? Can't you sit here with me? We never sit and watch the show anymore. Um, 45 minutes. I'll be back. It's no big deal. I'll see you then I'll, I'll bring food with me. You know, that's the guy test passed. I'm on my mission, but, um, still recognize you're important. I'll be back. Don't worry about it. Bring some food still. Only. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So you see that kind of stuff all the time. And that's what I, I assume you've seen with your changes. Oh yeah. No, absolutely. It uh, did help me a lot. I'm oh, sorry. No worries. I got a piece of ice. <laughs> uh, but yeah, man, like I said it's it's helped me out a lot. And I've uh, I've got a buddy who I, I, it was actually a buddy of mine that put me on your book, and it's helped him okay. a lot too. Like it, it really was. He was like, man, he's like, I know you're trying to do this this five love languages thing. He said, you know, you're trying to trying to trying to love the right way and stuff, you know, which I mean that book did open my eyes to a lot of things that I wasn't doing, you know, for my spouse as a man, you know. But he was like, dude, he's like, check out the dead bedroom picks. Mm -hmm. And I listened to it and I was just I've done the audio version of it. And I was just like, it it did. It opened my mind up to some of the things that I need to be doing for myself, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, just for simple, like, what's your motto? If she don't respect you, she's not fucking you. <laughs> I mean, yeah. That is like the DSO motto, man. Yep. And, and, and that's so true. I've noticed yeah. that, you know, the, really the less I worry about it, the more I get it, you know? Uh, and, yeah. and, it, and it's crazy because I'm the chaser, you know? I'm like, I'm shoot, I'm a man. I'm on uh uh testosterone replacement therapy so that automatically just amps up my sex drive because i had absolutely nothing wrong with my sex drive and that just amps and it up some. Yeah. yeah yeah and then so i'm just chasing it you know it's like man, we yeah. go five times a day let's go you know and and you notice i noticed it be kind of the stale all right well come on you know i was like yeah. you know what i don't even want it now like no <laughs> you know yeah. but i noticed the more the less i worried about it the more I focused on myself and the things that I had going on, like yeah. the more she initiated it, like, Hey, you want to go? And there's a few times I'm like, man, I don't feel like it, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but, but what like, does that show? That shows you're a man of what we call abundance, right? Like, I'm not begging for every little crumb that you give me, yeah. you know? And, uh, you know, if the, my wife, we just had a baby here four weeks ago and uh, she's made little insinuations of, we're not having as much sex right now. And I'm just looking at her like, you just had a cesarean section. They just basically gutted you on an operating table, ripped a child out of your body. And then afterwards, after a few days later, she had to go back to the hospital because she had what was called preeclampsia, which is her blood pressure was through the roof. She could have died. Right. Here, here we are a couple of weeks later at home and she's being told you can't move for six weeks, stay put. And she feels bad about not having sex. And I'm just looking at her like... <laughs> <laughs> there's more important things in the world right now. So I appreciate the the sentiment, but when she rolls over and starts grabbing at things, I'm just going to pat her and say, no, no, easy, easy. <laughs> I don't want you rushing. <laughs> but um, that shows that I'm not some, oh yeah, shoo, I'm glad finally I can get some. I've been dying for it these last couple of weeks. No, I'm, you know, the term I like to use, I'm not a slave to my balls. 
I'm a man. I'm not a little teenage boy that's like, oh, finally, I get, I'm getting lucky. It's like, no. Um, <laughs> there's, um, you know, I want to go back to you. You pointed out where that mindset you're in, you're less anxious about it. You're less needy. You're, you're distracted, for, for lack of a better term, by a mission and everything else. All of a sudden, the sex stuff kind of takes care of itself. It's kind of like um, if you ever played sports, if you've ever been on like, a, I used to play basketball a lot, and you're in a game and you're just blowing the other team out and you're up by like 40 points and there's no doubt you're going to win this thing. All of a sudden you loosen up and you have the game of your life and you just start scoring like crazy and you're passing like crazy. Everything's loosey goosey and it's fun. And you're just throwing up shots and half of them are going in. You're like, where the hell does this come from? Well, because that tension's gone, that stress is gone. Oh, I need, I need to win. Shoo, that, that's done. Now, now it's fun again. Probably. Same kind of thing. Now it's fun again. Now it's, I'm worried about my podcast and I'm worried about this and that. And it's just, oh yeah, wife, you know, that's way different than coming home. And like, I wonder if we're going to have sex today. Yeah. When, you, when you have that mindset, I wonder if we're going to have sex today. That permeates like everything in your life. Wow. Your little actions, every little touch you make of her, she, she can smell that a mile away. Like, oh, come here comes Mr. Needy. <laughs> and men right. talk about their wives literally recoil. Like, oh, when the guy touches them, he's like, geez, I was just touching you. She's like, yeah, but every time you do, I know what that means. It's like, great. Wow. Cause you're acting like a needy little kid. Right. And you're, you're seeing what happens when you act like a man. And um, in our discussion groups that we have on Facebook with the DSO fraternity, which by the way, go to dsofraternity.com and that will just, that will redirect you to our website where you can learn more about it. Um, there's guys have little mantras that they come up and one of them was, uh, what would James Bond do? So <laughs> if, if, you, if you want like an archetype or some type of model to follow, the fictional character of James Bond is pretty much as alpha male as you can get. He can walk into a room, he looks good. Every woman's like, well, who is that? And he doesn't give a shit. He just sits down, has a drink, does some gambling, flirts with a gal. If she doesn't want to, see you later. And he's off to kill some bad guys. Doesn't get more tough than that. What he's not going to do is walk into a room. I wonder if this woman's going to want to have sex with me. He's not going to be super needy, et cetera, et cetera. So if that helps you guys to kind of super simplify it, what would James Bond do? There you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're, they're going to be coming to him, you know, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> they're definitely going to be coming. And this was something I've noticed. Like I said, man, like, I'm not going to say like the less interest you show. Well, I mean, in a sense, I guess I am showing the, the less interest you show, the more I feel like it, it spikes their interest. Like, Oh no, something wrong with me. You know, is he talking to another woman? And, and I, and I, and I hate that. And, but there, you know, I, I, I see where you're going where you're like, I want to be an asshole. Yeah you know, totally ignore the woman and push her away. And, but there's a little sprinkling of asshole for lack of a better <laughs> term in there. But really, if you were to ask any psychologist and describe what it is you're doing he or she would look at you straight face and said, well, congrats. You're a mentally healthy person. You're, you're not super needy. You're not just always hanging on. I wonder what he or she thinks about this. Oh. You're doing things. And what you'll find is ironically, your actions will be more altruistic and more genuinely good because you're not doing them because I wonder if my, this will result in affection for my wife. I'm yeah, doing this. I wanted to say at a boy and you know, you're yeah, just doing yeah. it cause you're doing it. like I I'm I'll, I'll be the first to say, and it sounds very not alpha male ish for lack of a better term. I'm a good housekeeper. I just am. I'll, I'll wake up in the morning before the wife does. Cause she's been up breastfeeding the kid and she's exhausted. I'll walk out into the kitchen and go time to unload the dishwasher. And I just do it. Cause I hate looking at a full dishwasher and then I go, there's crumbs and shit all over the floor and I clean it up. Oh, we haven't done this laundry yet. And I just do it. None of that is done because I wonder what my wife will say when she sees I've done all this. <laughs> just shit you got to do. Cause I'm annoyed by looking at it. I'm like, ugh, what, what kind of, what kind of man would I be? I'm like, look at that pile of laundry and go wife will do it. <laughs> Yeah, moving on. Just take care of yeah. shit, you know? Yeah. And that's one thing I noticed, like, in your book and, and listening to some of your podcasts as well. He also has a podcast, guys. Uh, DSO, Dad's Starting Over. You know, what, is it any podcast platform? I know I listen yeah. to you on Spotify. It's pretty much in all of them, yeah. Yeah, but well, that's one Apple. thing I've noticed, you know, with yeah. some, of, some of our friends, you know, we'd be talking about it and stuff, but they'd be like, man, you know, like as far as the – the doing something to expect something in return you know that that attaboy i had a buddy on, on the podcast uh the other day and he was talking about how he would used to 
he'd leave the vacuum cleaner out in the middle of the floor after he got done vacuuming. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's the, and that's the thing, man. Like like going yeah. back on your like going back on your book. Like I, I used to do the same thing. You know, I mean, I used to do the same thing. You know, I was the type of person like I never had a problem with women. You know, I chased. You know, I, I I've had plentiful of, of women. You know, and and so this is really the first real relationship I've been in, and it's kind of you know it's gotten stagnant over the years, and and you you just think from the very beginning like we're just gonna have this great sex this great relationship you know through this whole time and then reality fucking hits and you're like shit you know <laughs> and then you start trying to that's not, that was my problems i never really coped with relationships mine normally was one night stance mm -hmm. you know wham bam thank you ma'am never talk to you again you mm -hmm. know there's probably a lot of women that's gonna watch this episode but yeah he's an asshole <laughs> you know from from 10 you know five ten years ago but that's, that's something like, like, like I've noticed, like, you know, it's something that you've got to, it's something you continuously got to work for. I, I, I honestly, I believe that the, the dating game never stops even in a marriage. Yeah. Uh, I, I really, I really believe that wholeheartedly. And I quit playing the game for a while and, and yeah. I had a dead bedroom, almost went through a debt, you know, through a, through a divorce. divorce. Yeah. You know, and, and once, you know, I said, I read your book and it, and it kind of kicked in a little bit like, Hey, you know, quit worrying about all this shit, you know, worry about yourself, you know, mm -hmm. go to the gym, mm -hmm. get fit, mm -hmm. you know, find something for you, uh, yeah. but being needy. And that's one thing I noticed like versus like the love languages versus your book, you know, and you know, in the five languages of love, one of the love languages is acts of service mm. where, you know, a woman feels validated by and loved by the, the actions and, and the services that you do for her washing dishes and stuff. And as well and, as gifts, gifts as, yeah. of, of appreciation or whatever the term is they use. Yeah. There. You know, it's funny to stop you there. Um, when guys on the groups and so forth ask, has anyone read this? My generic response is the love languages as a whole are pretty much horseshit. And, <laughs> but, but there's, there's, of course, there's validity to it. The problem is if I take using my book as the, as the archetype for the relationship, which is the under sexed husband and the wife who really lost interest years ago. And you give those guys the quiz and say, what do you want? The guy's 99.9% .9 of the time is going to say, uh, what physical touch is that the one that actually, my, I, th I honestly think, well, the physical touch in the book was, was kind of referring to like, like touching, you know, not Just so much as touch. it. Yeah. Not like easy. literal touch. Yeah. I well, think there's one yeah. that's acts of, of, um, it's feeling appreciated, feeling validated as a man. I think there that is the number one. I was going to say, that's the one that basically they tie hand in hand. Right. When a woman is touching you, she's validating you that I still care about you, still here, still love you, still appreciate you. Um, that is something, you know, if, if we just take this podcast to the direction of, so what do we tell ladies? How can they be better? My number one thing, and I wrote on the website about it, how to be a better wife is learn how to validate. Um, because women early in the relationships are validating machines. Oh yeah. And they know it and they just, they don't know it. They unconsciously know it. They just, they know how to say what to say, when to say it. Um, I give the example of a guy's driving in a car and he goes, look at that cool car over there. And if it's a new girlfriend, she goes, Ooh, I like it. It's pretty. I like that car. He goes, yeah, that's a 67 Corvette. Oh, really? What's something like that cost? Well, it costs this much. Oh, can you get one? Psh, no, I can't afford one of those. Yada, yada, yada. And on and on they go. Yeah. Later on the uh, later on down the line, <laughs> kid, whatever. He goes, look at that cool car over there. She's just tapping away to her phone. Uh-huh. And he starts getting pissed because he's like, would it kill her just to act like she's a little interested in something I'm interested in? Uh -huh. He'll say something and then she'll just look up her phone and say, I don't know why you keep mentioning those old cars. You know, I think they're stupid huge fail on the woman's part. I can't even get a little bit of excited about something and validate your feelings in that point. You're just telling him right there in that point. I don't give a shit. Say whatever you want. Just what's going on. In my phone's more important right now. Ladies. And here's the thing. Ladies hear that and roll their eyes and go, Oh God, men are such babies. They're such uh, they're so sensitive. So I got to act like I like everything that he likes. Yeah. <laughs> somewhat I mean, to some degree um yeah. no you don't have to just fall all over yourself and go oh my god yes corvettes are amazing but at least show that you're invested somewhat yeah. in him man that goes it does it goes a long ways it long goes way. a long oh, way husband you look so good in that shirt today 
well, hello. All right. You know, he walks a little taller that day. I look good. I'm going out. I'm feeling good about myself. You know, the man's starting to lose a little bit. You're starting to look good. You should keep it up. Go to the gym. I like my new lean, mean man. Uh, as opposed to why are you going to the gym every day? You're going to cheat on me, et cetera, et cetera. Which is somewhat understandable, but still that little bit of validation goes a long way. Now, the ultimate version of validation, as we know, is take your clothes off and let's rub our dirty parts together and have sex. That's the ultimate form of validation. Every guy wants that, but not not 24-7. Yeah. We'll take the little rubs. We'll take the little, you look so cute today. We'll take that. Oh, just, yeah. That just keeps us going for sure. It now, does. going back to the love languages, um, the problem with it is using the um, relationship archetype again, under sex guy, I just want some kind of touch, some kind of validation. You ask the wife, I just want him to do more shit for me. And talk and to me more. And give me stuff usually is what I hear yeah. often. Uh. <laughs> um, take that same woman, put her in a brand new relationship with a brand new guy that she's really hot and heavy and crazy about, which women are typically more hot and heavy early in the relationship. And all of a sudden that love language survey comes back a little different. And she's all about, I want touch. And she's all about, I want the, the physical and everything else. Because naturally at that point in time, that's what she wants. She's crazy about the guy. So they tend to be, they tend to fluctuate with time. And if you do your work right and you build yourself up to be a more attractive person, all of a sudden you retake that test and you're going to notice the woman's going to say much the same of what she says during the early part of the relationship with a brand new relationship. She's like, yeah, I, I want to touch him more. She's just naturally turned on more and she wants him to touch her and um, she's going to feel a little star for it. That's a good thing. So I get where they're coming from, which is the love languages. You know, the one thing I, um, I hear a lot about my writing, not to pop myself on the back too much about what I'm proud of is I get to the damn point. It's not chapter after chapter after chapter of feelings and thoughts. And let's study the psychology behind this and stuff. It's just boom, 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 done. And a lot of guys are like, oh, thank God. <laughs> and, and some women who read it are like laughing because this is such a simple book. Oh, my God, I read it in like two days. I'm like, yeah, welcome to a men's book. That's what yeah. we like. We don't like all the fluff and nonsense. And you call it for what it is. I mean, there's many times like you may want to be, you know, you may, you, or you're probably doing this. Well, that's fucking stupid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and man, it's, it is it's blunt. It's right down to the point. I mean, just for example, like going to the acts of service on, in the, the five languages of love versus your version, you know, show this love to your woman because this is how she wants to be loved. And your version is like, do the fucking dishes because you're a man. Yeah. You know, do them because they need to be done and, and don't expect anything you know, from your woman for, for being a man and, and doing what needs to be done around the house. Mm -hmm. There you go. <laughs> but, and they accomplish much the same thing, don't they? Yeah, they do. It, it's just, you're putting it more of a, yeah, here it is. You and, know, you know the, the, um, in the woman's mind, trying to empathize more with her. It's like, I got a guy who doesn't really seem to give a shit. I just see his shit all over the floor. He just walks right over it. He doesn't even notice it. He notices the, the floor needs mop it. I, I'll be damned if I have, you know, I have to drag him in there to have him help. And I have to ask him and it makes me feel like his mommy. I don't want to be his mommy. I want a partner. Somebody's going to help out with this kind of stuff, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then if, and when he does, he brings it up to him and says, look what I did. And it's just like, ugh, there goes the mommy thing again. It's just such a turnoff versus the guy who just does it and doesn't bring it up. And then she says, wait, did you, did you mop the floor and do the dishes? And he's like, yeah, I guess I did. Yeah, that was this morning. Why? Oh, nothing. That was awesome. Thanks. Yeah. You're, you're welcome. No you problem. Know, I'm, I'm same thing. It accomplishes the same thing. The dishes are done. The yeah. floor's mopped. Yeah. I was I was that guy at a point in time in my relationship. Like, I bet if I do this for her, she probably I might get something or not. You know. And I, I mean, seriously, I was that guy. I ain't afraid to admit it. You know, I'm, I'm all for. You know, I'll, I'll mention. You know, previously on a, a couple mm -hmm. of my other episodes. You know, I've I've traded out services for sex. My wife. Hey, if you give the baby a bath, we'll go do it. You know, I've been there like Mr. Clean, you know, like <laughs> scrubbing bubbles, buddy. Just get just going to town on and bath bomb yeah. and everything, you know. But then I I, I noticed like, you know, I, you know, me being a man, I do, you know, I need to keep the house clean, need to do my part, you know, and not expect anything in return. And I've noticed that as far as like, I'll just give my son a bath and she'll be like, Thanks for giving him a bath. And I'm mm -hmm. just like, Yeah. Yeah, no problem. It ain't no thing. And she's like, 
literally like thanked you like three times for doing stuff and you're just like oh well it's like it's, it's, it's for the point that i should be doing it i shouldn't have to expect mm-hmm. anything from you not even to thank you you know yeah you know it's my kid too it's my dishes too it's it's my house too you know and i've noticed a big thing you know big change in that as, as well on that note um that looking for some validation in terms of thank you for doing thank you for doing thank you for doing it's kind of a feminine trait. Uh, knowing that, uh, I am Mr. Thank you to the wife. When she does anything, I'm just like, hey, thanks for folding the clothes. Blah, blah, blah. Thanks for, uh, oh, did you make the bed thing? I'm the guy who's, I'm super thankful for everything. And she just beams that he recognizes what I do and he recognizes the work I put in and wow. he's doing it himself. It just is it, is it uh, only a little form of validation. It's still, it's still validation. Yeah, it still it, is. It, it's big for women. It's, it's huge it's, it's big it's for not. men too you know it made me feel good you know it definitely yeah, sure. made me feel good but I, I played it off like you know hey you know that's what it is i'm supposed to do that but uh the ultimate form of validation for men which a lot of us don't see is the some form of the crowded room let's say you're at a christmas party for work or something like that and you're with your wife and she's surrounded by a bunch of girlfriends and she elbows them and says see that guy over there that went across that's my man right there that's my man that's the ultimate form of that, that gets us, you know, stand a little taller that she's saying, there's my special dude. I want all you women to know, like that one's mine right there. Yeah. I'm showing, I'm showing them off. Yeah. And for all the guys that are, that are watching this, you know, that takes work. Like, like you, Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's that takes true. work. That's something I realized. Get back in the gym, you know, woman ain't going to brag about a man that that's gained, you know, 60 pounds and, and, you know, during his, time off from work or whatever the case may be he sits his you know fat ass on the t- or, you know on the couch for you know hours on the end of the time it doesn't do anything it, it, that takes work you know yeah and the ultimate <laughs> what a lot of guys tell me is you know using that christmas party analogy um the cute floozy at work which there always seems to be a cute floozy at work she wouldn't leave me alone during the Christmas party. She was hanging all over me and talking to me and buying me drinks and everything else. What do you think that guy, what's going to happen to that guy when he gets home? It's going to get laid because the wife's going to notice that the prettiest girl, the company, the cheap floozy who could probably get any man she wants was hanging all over her dude. Um, that again, sounds kind of sexist and sounds kind of like, Oh geez, here we go. But uh, any woman, uh, yeah, I talked about, you and I chatted before this that I uh, did a podcast with Miss Suzanne Venker, who has a pretty huge following, and she's always very adamant every time we talk that, yeah, I don't know how why it is we're wired this way, but when we see other women want our man, that really gets us going. Yeah, and I think any woman in it's a little bit of honesty will tell you the same thing. That's oh, yeah. huge. No, absolutely. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with my man is wanted by other women, and that makes me turns me on. Um, some men almost look at that as kind of a pseudo that's not genuine turned on. No, it is. <laughs> yeah. And she's afraid she's supposed to lose her man. She's going to do what she's going to do. That's okay with me. I'll, I'll have sex like she's that. Genuinely, <laughs> she's genuinely turned on in the moment. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think I've shared this story before on the podcast. If not, you got an exclusive. This was, um, man, I think my wife and I were together for about a year and I woke up one morning and there was a text on my phone early in the morning. And it's like, um, hey, is this so-and-so? How you doing? And I was like, this text came in at like three in the morning. It's like, what is this? I was like, yeah, who is this? She's like, this is Beth. Sorry, Beth, I don't know who you are. What's, how can I help you? And she's like, I got your number from somebody. I think you're cute, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, well, hello. And it's like, uh, sorry, Beth, but I'm with somebody. I appreciate it. Screenshotted, sent it to my uh, then girlfriend, who's my now wife. And said, look what I got. You better believe I had some awesome times in the bedroom after that thing, because Beth didn't give it up either. By the way, Beth sent me pictures of herself. Beth was, Beth was all right. And I, (laughs) it it got a little ridiculous to the point where I'm like, I think somebody's fucking with me. I don't know if somebody's, some friend is joking around with me or something, but this Beth kept it up for a while to the point where I had to block her and say, I don't know what's going on with this psycho Beth person, but that, that resulted in a wife who was obviously a little, Worried's not the right word, but she realized territorial. That, there you go. That's a good word. That's my man. 
and uh, watch this. Basically, is what my <laughs> yeah, is. yeah. Hold my beer. And watch I this. enjoy the spoils. And uh, I remember telling a friend this, and he goes, "You know what you should do? You should start a service where you send fake messages to guys pretending <laughs> to be women attracted." To- <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome. Not a bad idea. <laughs> really not. <laughs> I would help fund that <laughs> until one of them's found out, and then that would be the ultimate in. Yeah, that was yeah, be the ultimate like looking at you like you're just a uh, you're what just kind of loser are yeah, you? Yeah, loser <laughs> pretending to be a woman to give me. A so, yeah. You know, you go on Google, you know, type yeah, in yeah. hot naked girl, you know, safe picture. picture. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, I've been thinking about you, but that's the thing, man. Like, I don't know if you noticed with like Facebook and, and like Snapchat now, like there's a lot of like bots. I mean, there's pretty much stuff like that already going on. Like I get like a hundred. Oh, yeah. requ- today from these just gorgeous ass women that you know aren't real <laughs> i um i deal with a lot of men who have uh, very little experience with women and some of these are kind of um pushover naive when it comes to the game and uh they fall for that stuff and they're like i'm talking to some gal from cleveland and she's sending me <laughs> pictures i'm like oh jesus <laughs> like, did you do a reverse google search on her no yeah there's 6,000 pictures of Sally from Cleveland. Just dude, don't have you sent her, have you sent her any money yet? Yeah. I sent her something. for a prank. Oh. So yeah, that's, that's pretty common. The guys are desperate. They are mm-hmm. this, uh, this relationship game for lack of a better term is tough. And it, it for a lot of guys to hear, I got to put in how much work to get laid. I got to put in how much work to be validated and to be seen as a valuable man. F this. I'm not, I don't want to play that game. And then they get even more pissed off when the results are what you expect, which is I haven't been laid in years. My wife won't touch me. My, I'm divorced and no woman even wants any, I haven't had a date. You know, he hears other men talking about, it. so I went on my fifth date this month and he's like, what? I haven't been on a date in two years. How are you doing this? The relationship game is tough. And a big part of it is just swallowing your ego and saying, yeah, I need to kind of wipe the old playbook clean and start over. And that may mean doing some of those shallow things that I think I'm too smart to do, like going to the gym, making myself look good, cleaning myself up. It may mean going out and getting turned down 200 times, just getting social, get that social anxiety out of your system and meeting, getting some drinks thrown in your face going out and meeting new people, not necessarily for dates and just meeting new people. And so that's tough. And, uh, it sounds super simplistic for me to say it ain't for everybody, but man, it ain't for everybody. It's not for everybody right now in your life. You're a dude that just got divorced. You went through a horrible thing, cheating, et cetera, et cetera. And you think you're ready to jump back on the horse a month later. Give it a year, two years, three years, have, you know, date around, go to therapy, be around men more, find your mission that you talk about, and then you'll be in the right headspace to maybe be in a relationship. I think that's why most, you know, marriages fail and second marriages fail and third marriages fail because you leave the first marriage with problems, with issues. And you, you're so eager to jump back into another relationship just for the simple fact that you feel like there was nothing wrong with you. You put all the blame on, you know, the other person. So you jump into this new relationship with the same problems that you brought into your marriage with that, without fixing anything. And then you, you're, it's eat, sleep, repeat. You're, you're taking them same problems into a different marriage to a different relationship. And it ends the same way. And I a hundred percent agree with you that, that you need to take time for yourself, you know, work on yourself, mental health, physical health, all of the above. And like you said, you know, I've always been told, you know, the best way to get over somebody is get under somebody, <laughs> you know, and, and, and to an extent, extent that's, I mean, that's true. It's worked for me in There's the past. To it. There's it's truth it's to worked it. yeah. for me in the past because I'm not a type of person that gets attached. I mean, I'm really not. I love my wife. I don't need my wife. I want my wife. And I've always been the type of person that I've never get attached, but most men, then that's that, that second, maybe third person. And that's being generous. You know, they're going to fall in love all over again. Mm -hmm. Very quickly, very quickly, surprisingly quickly. And it seems to be, there's a a correlation and an inverse correlation, if you will, between a man who's been really, really super duper hurt by a woman. I mean, she took him for a lot of money, cheated nine times, et cetera, et cetera. Those guys fall hard for the next one that they, get with um 
in a way they're kind of conditioned after years. Some of these guys for decades, like I've been a married man for 20 years. That's all I know. Um, come home to somebody, share everything, every part of my life with somebody, you know, you got a favorite TV show, a favorite restaurant, a favorite song. A favorite, and that just went away. Right. And now I'm left with, it's just me, little old me in my head. And I feel like I'm going nuts. I don't know who the hell I am. I don't know what to do. I don't know what hobbies, interest, mission. That what the hell does that mean? <laughs> right. um, friends, all my friends are off their kids' soccer games and everything else. I haven't hung out with a buddy. In I don't know how long. And hmm, what better way to get over this little mini depression I'm in? I know I'll get a new girl. <laughs> That's how it and goes. Um, what they find is if they got a little bit of looks and a little bit of charm and some game, if you want to call it that, it's not that hard because there's a lot of whack jobs out there that are waiting for men. And they're just ready to take advantage, and it, it ends horribly every time. Absolutely. I Absolutely. Way too much. Absolutely. Well, guys, we'll be right back after this message from our sponsor. And we're back. Man, that's the thing about testosterone, man. It's, it's helped me. And, and I know, and I've noticed that, like going back to your very first podcast episodes versus my very first podcast, we talked about the same thing. You know, hormone replacement yeah. therapy, the testosterone replacement therapy. Yeah, I've been on for six, seven years now. Yeah. I've been, I've been on it for about, I don't know, three months, four months. Are you, already <laughs> seeing, are you already seeing some results? Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. Man, my drive, my, yeah. my just energy. drive in general, energy as a man, you know, it, it's, it's through the roof. I honestly feel like I'm 18 again, which I'm 30. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm not too far off from 18. Yeah. But yeah, it's definitely, I, uh, um, I noticed, uh, I definitely noticed the biggest oomph, like first year, um, major physical changes, emotional change. I, I had some anxiety, especially after the divorce and stuff. Um, uh, some background on me is that my mom is a very anxious person and that made me kind of a very anxious kid. And I noticed as I moved away from the house, that kind of dwindled a bit. And as I became an adult, but then the marriage number one and the kids and the stress and then the divorce really ramped up the anxiety again. Um, but after the divorce and with the testosterone, anxiety, pff, gone. Yeah. That was huge for me. Just, huge. you know, you kind of like, uh, I just don't give a shit what people think anymore kind of level of thought process. I, I remember um, I used to be very self-conscious about how I looked and stuff all the time. And I remember being... Uh, uh, coaching my kids basketball team and being out on the floor and standing there and not giving a shit what people were seeing as I'm in a big crowded, you know, gym full of people as I'm standing in front of all of them. And I remember thinking that's, that's new for me. I used to be very self-conscious as my shirt tight as my, da, da, da. then I was just, I didn't care. So that was new for me. Um, then the physical, obviously some uh, muscle, I gained like 20 pounds of muscle and some things were very obvious, like the traps that I'd never had before shoulders, things like that. And right. uh, um, so yeah, it's nothing but good for me. Um, nothing but good for me. <laughs> uh, it's been, uh, there was that initial year or two of holy shit. And then it's kind of dwindled. And now that I'm getting closer to 50, you know, think it's not a miracle drug. Uh, um, things are hurting right. and I, I can't work out every day. Um, I can recurring injuries, tendons most of the time and stuff like that. Uh, there's uh, issues with uh, uh, fertility for most men. Uh, it knocks your fertility down quite a bit, if not completely. Yeah, that's one thing they told me when I started. Like, are you yeah. planning on having a kid anytime soon? And I'm like, I don't know. It just depends on on how good yeah. this stuff works. <laughs> <laughs> if uh, if you do plan on, you'll probably have to come off, right? And uh, go on something like HCG to ramp up your your. Yeah, that's what it is. I think one of my buddies, he's trying to have a kid while mm -hmm. taking testosterone, and oh, Josh Rogers at Men's Wellness oh. is is trying to. Mix the testosterone in with what you were just talking about. The HMG, HMG, yeah, those are things that get the testes going and, and ramp up sperm production. Yeah. For some I do men, notice. <laughs> it doesn't happen. Yeah, I was gonna say, no. For some men, no matter what, it doesn't happen. They're on testosterone. They got to come off of it completely to ramp up the sperm production again. Absolutely. That's one thing I have noticed. That is one thing I have noticed is the shrinkage in the testicles. Yeah, like it went from yeah, from golf sure. balls to to marbles, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, then they'll, they'll become raisins probably if you keep probably. it up. Yeah, um, it's just your body's way of saying don't need these anymore. Yeah, absolutely. You're getting all the tests from a uh, shot in the butt or yeah. cream or whatever it may be, well, and yeah. Um, yeah, the HCG can remedy that somewhat. 
Oh no, absolutely. I, but, but I've always said, you know, I, you know, my balls are smaller, but it makes my makes my penis look bigger. So there's there's a plus. In that. <laughs> you should you should write their brochures for. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but um, have you had any issues with estrogen? Not yet. I haven't. I haven't. I've, uh, uh, that's uh, when I first started years ago. It was uh, basically. Here's your testosterone, and here's your what they called an aromatase inhibitor, uh, Arimidex, which keeps your estrogen down. That gives just part of the game. Here you go. Um, it turns out that was right for me because they later said uh, we're not the current thought process is we're not too keen on the idea of lowering estrogen too much and using these if we don't have to because there's a lot of good that comes from having estrogen in your system, heart health, and other things. Um, so let's not use that. So I remember I went off of it and my estrogen just skyrocketed. So I'm the type of person that for whatever reason, you give me testosterone and you don't control my estrogen, it just goes to the roof and your nipples start hurting. You become emotional, you become bloated, your face, be, basically like a woman going through, you know, menstrual cycle or whatever. And you start crying on, on commercials on TV. You're like, Oh, something's up here. <laughs> <laughs> and then they, te they test your, your do a blood test and wow, your estrogen's through the roof. So some men need it. Some men don't. I'm one of those that does for whatever yeah. reason. Absolutely. And that's one thing, guys, if you have any of those symptoms as far as no drive, your sex drives now, and you're, you're feeling a little more uh, emotional than, than what you're used to, uh, go see Josh Rogers at Men's Wellness of North Alabama and see if testosterone replacement is right for you. Very but, cool. Absolutely. But anyway, you got a, you got a couple more books as well, right? I do. And they're not nearly as popular as The Dead Bedroom Fix. The second book I wrote was called Now What? A guide, a guide for men starting over in life after infidelity, breakup, and divorce. So a lot of guys are like, well, now what the hell do I do? You know, so that's what the, the title's inferring. Now what? And then the third, um, actually, it's more popular than now what? It's called Red Flags. Very quick read, $4.99. And uh, it's 20 common red flags for men that are like, I'm ready, to, I'm ready to meet Mrs. Wright. What do I need to look out for? Some guys reading that book go, well, duh. You know, who doesn't know this? Probably three fourths of the guys reading it go, well, where were you 10 years ago? She's no one ever told me some of the stuff. And it's pretty, um, pretty, you know, self-explanatory duh kind of stuff. And some of it's some stuff that guys really haven't given much thought to. And what I hear a lot of guys say is, huh, I'm with a woman and she's 17 out of the 20. <laughs> this isn't good. All right. <laughs> yeah. Now a, a red flag is not necessarily if you see this shit run, it's if you see this, your ears should perk up a little bit and you should go, I'm just paid better, close attention to this. You know, it doesn't says she doesn't have a father figure in her life. That doesn't make her a bad person. What if, you know, it's not, not her fault. Poor thing. But is she the type that deals with red flags are not necessarily bad. If a person recognizes them in themselves and says, I better deal with that. That's something I got to deal with. I'm going to get help with that. And I'm, I'm going to make sure I'm going to put up boundaries to make sure I don't do fill in the blank. A lot of people don't do that. Men and women, they're just like, um, my father cheated had 20 different girlfriends and he was an alcoholic and yada, yada, yada. Some people listen to that and go, I'm going to learn to put up boundaries, be a good husband. And I'm not going to touch booze because I got it. My, his, my dad, my dad's dad were alcoholics. And da, da, da. That's pretty rare. Um, so the red flag, but it shows that the guy's strong. He's learned how to overcome it. Um, it's rare in a partner these days. And for whatever reason, it's really rare in finding a, a woman who recognizes, yeah, I got some issues and I better get some help with it. Um, a lot of women don't like to be told that they're quote broken in any certain way. And I think society as a whole has done a really good slash bad job of telling women, you go girl, no matter what you are all right. And I'm there to say, not necessarily. <laughs> You could, have, you could have some really shitty stuff going on that you need to take a close look at because you're just causing chaos everywhere you're going. And um, these poor guys that I'm talking to, two, three kids, and they're like, I didn't see this coming. I caught her for the third time screwing around with some guy. She racked up $50,000 of credit card debt, whatever the case may be. And I always tell these guys, well, let's turn back the hands of time. Tell me about her childhood. And some of the worst shit imaginable comes out of their mouths. And I'm like, and you knew this going into the relationship? Yes. And what other red flags did you see along the way? Well, boom, 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 boom. And you kept at it with her? Yes. And married her? Yep. And had kids? Yeah. Why? It's just what you do. 
Um, I, I loved her in spite of, I actually thought she was tougher because of having gone through all that shit. Did she ever get help with it? No. Did she ever acknowledge it? Yeah. She talked about it, but she didn't want to really talk deeply about it and how it affected her. She's just like, eh, I don't want to go there. That's how she dealt with it. Good luck. So that's what that book's about. Those red flags to look out for. Awesome. Awesome. And you, you've agreed to give away a digital copy of your bedroom fix today Dead on bedroom. this episode. Yeah. Yeah. Dead bedroom fix. So you pick somebody and I'll email it over to him for sure. Awesome guys. Well, well there's going to be, a, there's going to be some rules to get your copy of the dead bedroom fix. And that's one, one copy. I need you to share this episode and make sure you scroll over to dad starting over and follow his Facebook page. That is dad starting over his Facebook page. And that's all you got to do. So if, if you have any kind of issues as, as a man, as a husband in, in a dead bedroom, this book may be for you. It, it's definitely helped me and it's helped a lot of people that I know. And, and it, it's, it's, it's all simple stuff. It's nothing hard. You know, it's all self. I believe it's, it's working on yourself to fix the dead bedroom fix. You're not going to fix it by, by asking and asking and asking. And, and it's just, it doesn't happen. Like, that's something yeah. I've, I've noticed. You don't want to get, you don't want to get caught up in the vicious circle of playing the victim role of, oh yeah, well, what about, what about her? Yeah. What about her? What about her? I, I hear that all the time. Work on you. And if it comes, it comes. If it don't, it don't, you know, that's something I've realized, you know, Thanks. like if, if it don't come, if it doesn't work out, I'm going to be fine. That, but that's, that's key right there. Because for a lot of men, and I say, play, play that scenario out in your head. Worst of the worst. You're what you do all this great stuff for X number of months or whatever it is. And you go, huh? And the wife just says, yeah, it's not happening. Well, what then? And some of these guys just flat out say, I'm sticking around no matter what. Fuck that. And I say, well, then these women have zero incentive to change. Zero. Mm -hmm. And that goes for anything in your life. You know, going back to that situation with the boss who says, you're going to come and work this weekend? And you're like, yes, sir. The boss is never going to change his mind. He's like, I'm going to milk this guy for all he's worth. I'm going to pay him the same $50,000 a year and see how many hours I can get out of him. He'd yeah. be stupid not to. And your wife's going to go, why the hell should I go through change? You're going to the gym. I'm not going to the gym. Why, why the hell would I do that? Yeah. You're being all loving and more attentive. I'm just going to keep ignoring you like I always have. Why wouldn't I? You yeah. ain't going anywhere. And I believe that's where a lot of in, in, infidelity comes from is, is seeking things outside of your relationship that you're not getting. Mm. Uh, I mean, and that's me. If I'm not getting sex uh, and it, it, it is a constant thing, I'm eventually probably more than likely me being a man, I'm going to venture off. I mean, men, if I'm not getting it here, I'm going to get it elsewhere. Men cheat, yep. you know, it, it's, you know, with my writing and so forth and all the guys, it, it tends to go in the direction of, holy shit, can you believe that these women do these horrible things? Women cheat, women do this, women do that. I had no idea. And we lose sight of the fact that if you don't put up those boundaries yourself, I don't care how much of a religious person you are. Or what it, there's, there's a limit. And um, some poor guy that hasn't had any validation, no sexual anything for months, if not years. I mean, I've heard 10 plus years from some guys. And I said, and now all of a sudden they wake up and they go, I've lost some fat and I've gained some muscle and I'm feeling confident. I got a whole new wardrobe and women are coming out of the woodwork. And I said, yeah, good luck. You're, you're, you're one. Oh, you're so cute away from having an affair real fast. And these guys tell me, oh, hell no, I'm not wired like that. Like, you're no. a human, yeah, you're you a are. human ass being you're wired like that. Yeah. And I wouldn't go to the far as cheating, you know, on, on my wife. I mean, I, I wouldn't, I would simply leave. Yeah. I mean, that's simple. I would, I would leave. And I've told her that, you know, if I ever come to the point and, you know, to my relationship where I feel like it's just not getting any better, you know, with the, with the work that I put in, the work that you put in, you know, I'll, I'll just leave. I'm not going to cheat on you. I'm not going to do that to you. I'm not going to do that to myself. That, you have that self-worth and you have that sense of abundance of I'll be fine. No. It, it'll suck. I'll miss you because I love you. That's why I'm married to you. And, but in the end, I'll be all right. Oh yeah. A lot of men don't have that, that step, that next step. It takes a lot of work to get there. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's another thing, guys. Like I said, the do that bedroom fix will help. I promise it will. And and and, and it might not just be in the in the dead bedroom, uh, the bedroom area. It, it'll help you as a whole as a man. And it has me and it has a lot of couple, you know, a couple of my friends as well. I said I was actually recommended this book by my friend. Mm -hmm. And uh so yeah. But man, I sure do appreciate you coming on. Thank you for having me. I appreciate and it. I do. I, I enjoyed it. I was really excited about this episode because, you know, I believe in you, what you do, what you're about. 
listen to your podcast every time you drop one. And it's, it's good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Well, guys, until next time, stay dad tough.